Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, The Science of Reading Meets Core Instruction, Bringing Research-Based Instruction to Life. My name is Laura Almazara, and I work on the literacy team here at Amplify. Today's webinar will be recorded, and we'll email out the recording link for you to rewatch as you'd like. And everyone here with us today will also receive a certificate of attendance. We have a live captioner with us, so if you want to access the captions, click on Live Transcript in the bottom tray. It's on the uh, right-hand side. Throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, please be sure to pop them in the Q&A, and we'll try to get to them at the end. We welcome comments in the chat. So to start, can we find out where everyone's from today and what you do in the education world? Central New York. I went to college in Syracuse. I, am, I live in Arizona now, and I'm very jealous that I don't get to experience your, uh, your fall anymore. Look at all these people coming in. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? Is it Friday yet? I should ask that question. Wow. It's yeah, crazy. it's Wednesday. So halfway there. Happy Wednesday. And thank you for joining. Welcome. Just a little housekeeping, and then I'll pass the mic over to our, our lovely for joining. speakers today. Uh, we have some more webinars in the series, which is called The Science of Reading is for Everyone, Building a Science of Reading System. So if you haven't signed up for any more, if you missed a couple, please check it out. You can find the webinars at amplify.com slash SOR dash everyone dash fall 2022. And today we are so excited to have Dr. Karen Venditti and Megan Mulbear with us. Uh, these ladies are both literacy curriculum specialists with extensive experience. They will be leading our conversation about bringing research-based instruction to life in your schools and classrooms. So take it away, Karen and Megan. Well, first, I just want to say welcome. I cannot believe we've got so many people from across the world. So I was going to say good afternoon, uh, but I think I, it's, it's good everything. So Megan. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. For, for joining I, I, across the world. Uh, yeah, it's, it's exciting. And I will just give everyone to Karen, if you could let me know, I'm getting some feedback that my internet's unstable. I just wanna throw that out there um, if, if someone could reach out. So, and, and you were just cutting in, I'm sorry if I cut you off. No, that's okay. You definitely will let you know. And it's, I hear a little choppiness, but I think we're good. So uh, we wanna make sure Megan can be heard. Megan has a lot of great things to share. And I know she's been out in schools this week and so have I. So we've got some definitely uh, things to share about that as well. And so uh, I'll go ahead and start. I'm Karen Venditti and I'm actually coming to you from Northwest Indiana, right outside Chicago. Uh, I've been an elementary teacher, middle school teacher, uh, actually college uh, students, pre-service educator, director of student teaching. Uh, and I'm so excited to be here with Megan today because we've had lots of work with teachers around high quality instructional materials. We are having a little feedback on there, Megan. I'm not sure if that's you or me. Um, there we go. Uh, and, and so we wanna share a lot with you related to what we see in schools and what we are work with uh, districts and leaders. And so we're going to have a little bit of a different emphasis today. Some of you may have been on webinars with Megan and I before. Um, maybe you've heard Laverne and Shirley being referred to. I don't know. But I'm going to turn it over to my counterpart, Laverne, um, and hope hope we can hear her. Yeah. Thank you so much. I don't know if it's me, but we cannot hear you, Megan, Megan. And I think Laura, Laura feels the same. I think I'm getting a message from Laura that we cannot hear you. And yes, you will get access to the presentation as Megan's kind of trying to fix that. I see a question in the chat. You will get access to the presentation. And um, someone asked, who's Laverne? Megan and I, kind of jokingly go by Laverne and Shirley. And that's a little bit, for those that may know, that's a little bit of an inside joke. We can share that with you at the end. Megan, how's your internet? How are... Yeah, it's so amazing. No, no. I'm not, I'm not hearing you. I'm gonna go ahead and um, 
have you, are you sharing your screen, Megan, or do you need me to? I think Karen, it looks like Megan dropped off. So if you want to take over for now, that would be great. Yeah, I will do that. So let me share my screen. Let me get this. Sorry about that. I was not ready to do that. There we go. Oh, no. I hit the wrong button. Sorry about that. Here we go. We're having a great day. Um, and I will just share with you and Megan, my, as she joins back, she might be able to share that she is has been a teacher of CKLA. She's currently a literacy curriculum specialist, but also the manager of our, of our pilot, our literacy pilots. And so she will definitely share some of that with you because we're doing a lot of pilot work right now. Now, today was gonna to be a little bit more informal anyway, and I guess that's how we got started um, already. I don't know if you were at the last two uh, webinars in the series uh, with Susan Lambert for talking about demystifying the science of reading in MTSS. It was really a conversation, and so was the conversation around data-driven instruction with Drs. Danielle D'Amico and Nancy Nelson. And so Megan and I wanted to kind of continue in that in that lens and share more of a conversation around that. I hope you got to hear the start where Susan really laid the groundwork for MTSS, that multi-tiered systems of support. And what we're going to do today is continue that conversation, but we're really focused on the tier one, because it is multi-tiered. And sometimes people are, are thinking more about that intervention. We're talking about prevention. So uh, Danielle and Nancy, Danielle and Nancy focused on the data driving that uh, instruction and, and the intervention and the multi-tiers. And so, as I said, we are going to really focus on the prevention and how do we do that with the our curriculum. And so, so how do we do that? When we think about a comprehensive literacy system, if you talked or if you were on Susan's call, if you were on Danielle's call, you saw this image. And this graphic is really representative of meeting the needs of kids in a system. Thinking about core being that real, that, that basic um, tool that allows us to reach the vast majority of our students. We get the greatest impact using a strong core curriculum because it's where we reach the most students. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. Now those other pieces work with that core. And when you're looking at a system like that, you wanna make sure those other pieces are aligned to that. And those other pieces are working in coordination with that core, because what we're gonna talk about in a minute with um, Dr. Doug Reeves, that conversation, a podcast you recently had, how everything really needs to be in alignment and how everything needs to have focus, how everything really needs to be going towards that one initiative, a focused initiative. And so how do we do that? With CKLA, with M-Class, with Amplify, we're actually going to start by assessing and we're determining are those, uh, are the data helping us determine instructional needs at the tier one level, at that preventative level. We're also then going to make sure that personalized learning, when we have students working on individualized instruction, that it's driven by data, it's tied to our, our core, and it's also you know, working on not just intervention in a, in, in a remedial way, but in an enriching way. We want all kids to have that personalized learning with intervention and enrichment. And then again, a very tiered focused intervention where we get into higher level tiers, our smaller number of students, at least that's what we want in that RTI pyramid, that smaller number of students at the top of the pyramid, we wanna make sure that those kids are getting the intervention that they need in tiers two and three. But again, we're working on the core today. And so we're gonna, as you heard the other day, M class is, is something that drives that instruction, drives all of that, that, that 
work that we do, but CKLA is what we're going to focus on along with Amplify Reading and M-Class Intervention in that ecosystem, but our prevention is CKLA. Now, I think Susan joked about this. I think maybe even Danielle, Danielle joked, joked about, about it or Nancy. Or... It's hard to come to a science of reading session without seeing Philip Goff and William Tumner's Simple View. And so this is one of those things this, that we all have seen it. We've all heard of it. We all know the research that allows us to reach students. What we're going to talk about in a moment is what, what do we need to be thinking about for the future related to this? Because we know this works. And you hear so many researchers. I don't care who, what webinar, what podcast. You hear so many people focus on this research we know what works but are we putting it into practice and that's that really hit home we heard, we heard doug, doug reed on, on the, the recent, recent podcast, podcast with susan, susan. Talk, talk about about you know we're really good at knowing what, knowing to, do. what to do that, that goes that. back to this but we're really bad at implementing it and so we know what to do. We know the simple view of reading works. We know students need word recognition, those foundational skills, the decoding, phonological awareness. We know they need oral language development, that vocabulary, that knowledge building uh, to become proficient readers. But are we really good at implementing it? That's the, that's the question. And that's what Megan and I wanna talk about today. And there's so many books and you know, there's so much that goes back in time when we talk about good to great. And some of you, some of you on the call, I won't age myself, but maybe when I put books like that up there, you recognize that that may be a little bit of an older book. Some of these titles are old, but they really help us focus on what we need to focus on to move students forward. And so when we think about a core curriculum, when we think about preventing, because remember, that's what we're working on, that prevention side of the MTSS, or so the prevention step of it, stage of that system. And how do we do that? Well, there's a lot of literature on how important focus is. How, and when we think about John Hattie and, and what collective teacher uh, efficacy and, and that belief in student learning, how important that is. Building to Impact, the 5D Implementation Playbook by Doug Reeves and his colleagues is something that really has hit home recently. And I cannot uh, implore you enough to listen to this episode. This really makes sense in terms of what's been happening, uh, maybe over some decades, and how do we move forward? How do we help schools, help teachers, help students get the skills they need to be successful in life because we know reading is one of those things that if you don't have it, uh, it's really going to be challenging to have a successful uh, existence. We know reading is it. And so if you haven't listened to this uh, episode and, and Susan did talk about this on her call, on her webinar earlier, uh, we really, really, uh, really encourage you to do so. And so, when we think about, so, and, and there are so many quotes, there are so many things that hit home from, um, from uh, Dr. Reeves, but I love this quote and I'll read it to you. When was the last time in education anybody ever heard of de-implementation? All we do is pile one thing on top of another, on top of another, and we wonder why it didn't work. And so as we think about that, you know, you may, and I, some of you, I'd love for you to put it in the chat. How many of you have seen things piled on over and over and things taken away or just piled on or part of it taken away or part of it added? And I take this piece because I like this piece or I, you know, how many of you have had that happen to you? Well, we don't want that because the focus won't be there. And that's the emphasis on focus. Uh, Megan, I see you here. I had my camera off, so I see you here. I'm wondering if 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 you can chat yet or if it's not going to happen today. No, you're on mute now. Now you're on mute. Nope. 
all right. So maybe Megan can share some things in the chat. Um, as she, as we and I would love her to love her to share some things in the chat as we talk about this. Doug Reeves talks about de-implementation, and the real emphasis on that was related to the medical community. And in the medical community, they don't start something new, like a new treatment, if they're using an old treatment. Because if they're using that old treatment at the same time with that new treatment, they're saying we don't know. The, the true cause and effect. So we have to de, they're de implement. They stop using an implementation before they use another, right? So that there is no confusion. That's what we're talking about. How many times do we just pile something else on? And I'll bet for those of you in the chat, and maybe you're talking to Megan in the chat, I hope you are, um, that you can relate. Uh, actually, I hope you can't relate to that because I hope you're not in a district that just piled some things on. But that that happened to me when I was teaching. You'd get a new thing. And one of the things, did you get time to 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 deal with it? So there's a lot of things that we want to talk about. And I'm so sorry Megan is not able to chat because this this is one of the best part of my week or month is is the time I do get to chat with Megan about things uh, related to to core curriculum, to to um, really students getting what they need. And so we we identified some real roadblocks, barriers to, to prevention. And remember that CKLA, that core curriculum, and we are going to talk about the core curriculum. We just wanted to set the stage for a little bit first um, because we do also wanna to talk to you further about the core. So we wanna, well, I want you to think about as you're looking at for a core, as you're looking for a change based on data, we hope that's based on data, but is there a focus? And you know, going back to Mike Schmoker and also uh, Doug Reeves talking about, are we focused on that initiative, on that implementation 100%? If we've got 25 things happening in our district, can we be focused really heavily on the one that we need to be focused on? And so how many initiatives do you have going? So I'll put that, you can put that in the chat too. I don't know if anybody wants to advertise that, but how many different things are you having to work on at the same time? You know, that's something that takes away from your focus. That definitely is something yeah. that keeps us from doing what we need to do on, on that emphasis, especially when we're looking at students reading achievement and, and making sure they get what they need. So that de-implementation is important. That de-implementation to say, let's find the, the thing that we need to focus on. Let's find that initiative and implement it well. Deep implementation. And I'm not gonna go into depth on, on Dr. Reeves' book. I encourage you to read that as well. But he does talk about five levels and Susan talked about that with him on the podcast. The one thing that really hit home to me and Megan as we were talking about it was the level of impact in, the, in, that, in those levels and how levels one, two, and three, you know, level one was simply just saying, hey, teachers, here's, here is uh, your curriculum. Put it in your room, give you some training. Then the level two, you know, are, is it being used? Have you ever had that kind of low level implementation? Somebody just turned something over to you. You might get some training. You might get a one shot that drive by, you know, professional development. Sometimes we call that spray and pray, right? We just hope we give it to you, you get it, you take it. Those lower levels of implementation don't have an impact. You've got to get to level four and five. And he talks about that <laughs> much more. I, I won't even try to. But if you don't get to those levels, sometimes and many times people just drop it. Then they say, oh, that's not working. Mm -hmm. And when it's not working, they just go to a new tool, a new initiative. So how deep was their focus? So their focus really needed to be, you know, it turned in turn into a cultural aspect, a cultural aspect of this is what we do as a school. This is what we do as a district. This is our goal. This is what we're working towards. But the higher level of implementation also requires data gathering and monitoring the impact. And so that's where, you know, that's where some, if it doesn't work immediately, we're gonna drop it and move on to something else. So 
he also talked about fidelity because when we talk about implementation, we do think about fidelity of implementation. And, you know, I have said this in, in trainings to folks, you know, it is that F word, Susan said it on her call the other day, that dreaded F word, but it doesn't have to be because fidelity can be a positive in the way that we know that everyone is working towards that focus. Now, Dr. Reeves mentioned the reason it has a kind of a negative connotation is because it's a binary um, kind of a thing that people look at it, either I'm doing it or I'm not, and do I get punished if I'm not? Am I reprimanded, am I not doing? Whereas there are levels of fidelity, there are levels of implementation really. And that's what we think about. And in CKLA, this is something kind of on a side note, but in CKLA, we actually provide leaders with a document and it can be used as a self-assessment for teachers looking at their levels of implementation with CKLA. It's not an either or. Uh, it's, it's mm -hmm. are we moving forward on that? And so that fidelity of implementation is something that we appreciate as teachers too, because I know my neighbor is getting the same, or my students in the next class are getting that same instruction maybe with just different teacher twists to it, the art of teaching, but they're still getting what they need. They're still getting those 150 sound spelling patterns for those 44 sounds. They're still getting that wonderful, rich knowledge and vocabulary. That's what we have to think about with Fidelity. Now, Dr. Karen. Mitchell, yes. Hey, Karen, it's Megan. So uh, I finally can talk. I'm like listening to you. And as you speak about fidelity, one thing that comes to mind is really just integrity, right? Like doing something really well, sticking to it, which kind of moves into that time uh, that we're talking about, right? Like, are we trying to fit this pedagogical shift into an older framework, into this balanced literacy framework? Um, are we giving teachers enough time to really see it through? And like you said, I, I love what we always say about bringing that art to this instruction. Are we giving teachers enough time to step into their, like who they are as a classroom teacher as they make that shift um, to actually, uh, to see if this is effective, right? Um, are we gonna get to that student achievement uh, level of implementation? And the only way we can really do that is to give it time. Exactly, exactly that time. And he talks about if we we can't give more time, there's no more time in the day. But if we're focused, if we're only doing the initiative that needs to happen, that time can be devoted to what it needs to be devoted towards. Um, and then Megan. Yeah. And one other thing about time, Karen, is that what's the first thing we see whenever districts move to strong tier one instruction? They have to blow up their schedules that have been developed for 20 years uh, to do that, right? If we want teachers to feel confident and successful, then there are going to be some system level decisions when it comes to schedules that are going to impact teacher success with uh, really moving through those levels of implementation. Exactly, exactly. And that, and honestly, yesterday I was in a school all day, schools, and that was the discussion after school with the teachers. We need to look at a different schedule. The schedule isn't meeting the needs of our students related to the curriculum. And so that is something that you, we, we hear regularly. We, we also hear, you know, related to all of these things, when we're looking at adopting a new curriculum, that process, where are we in that process? Have we started with that focus? And Megan and I work with a lot of folks um, and as you're all on the call today, you're thinking about looking at curriculum, you know, that's hearing about CKLA, hearing about that wonderful tool to prevent those intervention needs. But where did we start? Did we start early enough so that we can get people focused? Because there's always buy-in that's necessary. There's always some folks that may have a, a different understanding of some of the research. So we have to really dig deeply and provide those tools to help folks move forward. And I know Megan has been involved with a lot of adoptions and, and can share a lot related to that. Yeah, and you know, I think that adoption process is, is such an important part of this, this, um, this road, this preventing um, of, of, of really students falling uh, or falling into that at-risk category. And what I mean by that is the adoption process is something that we can't just decide tomorrow and establish in one day. It's what have we done to prepare to really inform teachers about what it is to be 
uh, to make an informed decision about core curriculum. But also, um, you know, how are we, we know that this is going to be a shift. We talked from the beginning about, we're really good at knowing what to do, but we're really bad at implementing it. It's such a strong quote because teachers can go through all of this science of reading training and they can have these great tools in front of them, high quality instructional materials. But when you actually put that into practice, there are some emotional shifts that, that are happening too. And so as we look at that adoption process, what rubrics or what tools do we really have in place to make sure that as teachers make these decisions, that these they're making an informed one and leaving that emotional aspect of maybe um, some things I've done in the past out of it, or how is this causing me to stretch? Because at the end of the day, we all show up as educators every day to do what's best for kids. And thank goodness we are in a time where we actually know what to do. And so it is gonna cause us to stretch. And so the Reading League has developed this great tool to do that. And I know Karen, you talk about this so well. Well, just, and I think Susan already mentioned it on her call as well. And I actually have a little copy of it here. This is what it looks like. So if you, are in need of that, we can share the link to that. Um, you want to make sure you're having informed decisions. And sometimes it's helping others get on board. Tools like this are really useful for doing that. And again, we can share more. We're, we definitely want to share more after this call related to that. Um, but now I think it's time. We've spent an awful lot of time kind of giving some background. And I'm sorry, Megan wasn't uh, joining us as much for that because that's always a benefit, but we really want to now go into what CKLA is because based on the science of reading, and that, that's something, you know, when you go back to CKLA in its origins, this isn't something where the simple view of reading is new to us. If you go back to the original discussion, this, the simple view of reading was explained in the teacher's guide from the get-go. It was something because we knew people needed to make a little bit of a shift at times. And so we were trying to help people. I think people are there now, um, but now we wanna explain how does CKLA meet those needs of language comprehension and word recognition. And so I'm, I wish Megan was gonna start, but I'm gonna start with language comprehension right now. And we're gonna dig into what does that mean? Well, first, this actually is a screenshot from our science of reading defining guide. I'm not gonna go into depth on this because I'm gonna kind of just go through these, these, these ideas as I share how CKLA addresses them. But you wanna look for examples of those practices that are aligned to that research. You want to also maybe be thinking about what is happening that isn't aligned to the research? And so while I said, like I said, I'm not going to go into depth on these, but you definitely have resources to do that. We also have a guide that we can share with you from Amplify that relates to looking for the shifts and how to look for that uh, in your instructional path. Now, the language comprehension side starts with knowledge building. It starts with vocabulary, rich vocabulary. So how do we do that? Some of you, may already be thinking about what does it mean to have a knowledge rich curriculum? So we wanna make sure we've got a wide variety of topics that are building, that are about the world. It is so neat to hear kids talk about the world. Um, it's designed across and within grades to build that knowledge. So you're going to have kids taking things from first grade into second grade and really sharing that. And I'll tell you what, your middle school and high school teachers will really appreciate it because kids are gonna come with wonderful knowledge. That vocabulary is an obvious you know, uh, a result of that because when we're building knowledge, we include rich vocabulary that connects to that. You're gonna support kiddos with that instruction, both while you're reading and while they're reading, um, but afterwards as well. It's all about you know, discussion and those questions and interaction and speaking and listening and writing about that. So making sure you're looking for those things. And so we actually have a poll question. I'd love for you to think about what you're doing right now. Does what you're, you know, in your current reading curriculum, focus on that, on the building of knowledge in that emphasis on you know, a rich tier two vocabulary. You know, think about, are you seeing that? Are you seeing that explicitly uh, included, explicitly taught? Are kids applying that knowledge? Are they applying that vocabulary? And I will give you a second to vote 
if we're there, if people are voting? You know, Karen, I also think, you know, in listening to this question, and we do this often, as you mentioned, and and really, like, in, in our experiences, at times, I think many districts have began to make this shift, right? Like, we understand content knowledge and uh, knowledge, uh, or rich, rich content knowledge is, uh, starting in kindergarten is important. But there's also these other layers to that. And, you know, in that slide previously, it was like, is it intentionally and systematically building knowledge? And I can't wait to dive into that because that's a whole nother layer of, of a knowledge-rich curriculum and what it entails too that I think often gets overlooked. Exactly. All right. I see. You know what? The biggest result, I'm sure everybody can see this, hit or miss. That goes back to fidelity that and we haven't even talked about equity yet that goes back to focus um so that makes me sad but it also makes me happy that you're here today and maybe hearing this conversation and can share that but um yeah that that's honestly that's not a surprise i don't know megan if that's a surprise for you hearing uh, that it's no no and in fact i think it goes back to that systematic approach right and like really what is this how when we think about a knowledge rich curriculum it's not just about what we're doing within that grade level right like i was really good at teaching xyz topic at first grade and so was my other colleague but how is that setting kids up for success by building that foundational those foundational levels of knowledge to build upon each year and so if it's hit or miss, even within the classroom, then we know it's hit or miss across the grade levels. Exactly. And that is, is so vital to bring to light. And I love the vulnerability of everyone here to be able to say like, hey, you know what, this is where we're at. Exactly, exactly. And then this does come up and bring to light of equity, an equity issue. Uh, we want all kids to have access to wonderful, rich content, wonderful, rich vocabulary. We know kids come to us with a wide range of experiences, we wanna make sure our kiddos are getting a wonderful uh, base of knowledge that will carry them forward as they move through school. And so, as you can see with CKLA and with Amplify ELA in our, our grade six to eight curriculum, there is an intentional uh, sequence we want to make sure kids are getting that knowledge starting as early as pre-K and moving on through uh, grade eight. Because as we move into middle school, it becomes so heavily focused on those subjects related to that knowledge. So this shows literature, history, social studies, science, um, arts, um, all those types of connections. And I know it's a little bit hard to see, but definitely as you look and as you're considering uh, looking further at CKLA, that's something you want to look at. Look at that wonderful, rich uh, knowledge and those connections. I saw the most amazing uh, lessons yesterday on the human body and the Middle Ages and early Asian civilizations. It was there was a trickster tale the kids reenacted, but using the vocabulary, it was it was just so neat to see that, and it was so exciting to see that. Um, and and so when we do build knowledge. You know, we think about the research behind how do we do that and why do we do that? And so one of the things we do is a read aloud. We do a read aloud every day in grades K to three. And we continue to read aloud as we move, but we do that for a reason. Now, I'm going to have you think and you can put a color in the chat if you want, if you want to uh, type something, get your fingers typing. This graph represents listening comprehension and reading comprehension. I took the little legend out because I wanted you to think about it, which color bars represent listening and which colored bars represent reading. And so I'll give you a second, Megan, tell me if things, are, I'm not, my chat is closed, I keep that closed. Tell me if things are coming in the chat, if people are guessing. Yeah, so I mean, it looks like there's an overwhelming response that orange is listening. Okay, they got it. I was just throwing a softball out there for you today. So it is listening comprehension. And this is why we read aloud to kids every day. You know that because you could get that answer. It starts from the get go. The kiddos are listening. So we're going to read aloud to kids every day. And as their skills, and Megan's going to talk so beautifully about these skills, as their skills become mastered, we're going to put reading in front of them and they're going to read that content or the decodable related to their, their current instruction. So how do we do it? We do a lot of 
um, images where kids are you know, talking about these images, lots of rich discussion. We've built in those comprehension questions and supports, whether you're challenging kids, whether you've got English language learners, when, when we provide those bridging and emerging, all those kinds of supports so that you can have great conversations from the get-go in pre-K onwards. We want those, it's so important to, to develop those speaking and listening skills. You have a reservation? Oh, I do. I'm gonna not play that for the sake of time, but that's a little video where we kind of activate some background knowledge and get kids excited about the topics because they do get excited about the topics and they get excited about vocabulary. And so do we, because we build a lot of great vocabulary and it's that tier two vocabulary. You know, I know that many kids are, are not coming with that vocabulary from exposure um, before they get to school. So we want to expose them to wonderful, rich vocabulary, that high transferability vocabulary that they're going to be able to use in other instances, that high utility that, where it applies in lots of instances. And then we're going to have them apply it to their own lives. So we have little lessons. We have, you know, we want kids interacting with the words. Um, I saw some great, I saw kids using the word unjust in a second grade classroom yesterday. And it was so neat to see that. And they did it beautifully. Kids can understand vocabulary if we give them the chance. And, and those little word work lessons apply that. Starting in kindergarten. And again, we're using images to help them understand whatever we're talking about in those um, domains. Now, we're also working on other vocabulary, multiple meaning words. Here's this, I, again, I'm giving you another softball. What is my multiple meaning word here? Somebody's gotta type it in the chat. Using those images, what is my multiple meaning word here? Any guesses? Any guesses? Megan, what's coming in? Did anybody get it? It looks like comb is coming in. All right, you got it. Again, we're going to teach that to kids. We're going to work through that, but they're going to get images. They're going to hear it related to that. This is the insects. And so you've got that honeycomb there. They're going to hear that related. And it's all part of the instruction because we know how important it is, especially for many of our English language learners to understand multiple meanings because that holds kiddos back. Now, that syntactic knowledge and awareness we want to make sure we're working on grammar in context. And here we're going to work on adverbs, how a grasshopper moves its wings. And I didn't even say this was all about insects when I started. But as you can see, as you probably surmised, it is all about insects. And so they're going to hear that. We're going to have the instructional path. So we provide that. So as Megan's the, the teacher teaching this, as I'm the teacher teaching this, kids are all getting this. We might do it a little bit differently and bring our own spin to it but we're definitely going to make sure kids are getting it and they're going to be doing these activities as we work through the vocabulary. And so sayings and phrases, again, our, our second language learners, that's something that is really problematic. Um, we're going to teach those within the context. And so you'll see that. What's also important though, and, and something I really didn't hit upon is that emphasis on both literary and informational text. And when you look at that, um, the literary concepts, it, when you talk about that in, in regards to Scarborough's Rope, you know, we want to make sure kids are seeing a wide range, points of view also. We want to make sure they see different points of view. We want to make sure they see first, second, third person, all those kinds of things, both in literary and informational text. And so you want to see that across your domains, across those um, instructional pieces. Using graphic organizers. It's, it is an ELA curriculum, but we're, we're focused on content to do those wonderful things. That graphic organizer helps us then with our writing. And we're going to write here an informational narrative. And that information, again, we're gonna write on, on, on narratives, um, uh, informational explanatory, persuasive. We're gonna to write to the, all the modes about all of this wonderful, rich content. And kids have so much to write about. And so as you think about, I, I know I kind of shared a lot with you, um, as you think about that, look at curriculum, look at high quality instructional materials and make sure those things are happening so you are meeting the needs of kids 
for them to move forward. But it's not just about that language comprehension side, right? It's also about the word recognition. And I'm so glad I am so, you don't know how glad I am that Megan got her mic working because I would never do this justice like she does. And so I'm so glad that she is able to take over the screen and yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing is, or do I need to share Megan? Actually, I, I am showing I'm sharing. Um, I just wanna confirm that you can see my screen. Yeah, I'm, it says I'm sharing, so let me. Okay, there we go. Can we see word recognition now? Yes, we can. And I'm hoping. Beautiful. That... Well, everyone, thank you for your patience. And hopefully you can see word recognition as we really look at, you know, thinking about everything Karen just shared with language comprehension. I love one point that Susan made at the beginning of this MCSS series is that she really said, hey, true or false is the science of reading all about uh, foundational skills or word recognition. And that is simply false. So I love that we start out with language comprehension because it's so vital, right? Uh, we can't forget about that part. Um, but obviously word recognition is, is also equally as important. Kids have to be able to lift words off of the page effortlessly to enable that cognitive energy that it takes to actually comprehend what they're reading. And so as we look at some like instructional practices, like what are these instructional practices that are aligned with the, the science of reading research and what are we trying to avoid here? When it comes to actually using this tool, this is a great way to kind of narrow down some options. Obviously a rubric would really look more specifically at criteria, but this is just such a quick tool to evaluate current practices where do we need to step up our game? What's really not aligning? And do we need to make those shifts? So as we look at word recognition, there are some really explicit things that we have, or really defined things that we have to do. And so I'll really unpack the reading rope. But from the top, we have to make sure that we're using a systematic scope and sequence. That the way that we're teaching foundational skills is moving from more simple to complex. That we're not just jumping into, um, you know, letter of the day or letter of the week instruction. That we're starting with that most foundational level with phonological awareness building to that more complex oral skill of blending and segmenting at the, the phoneme level. Um, those are really basic, essential foundational skills that I know for as a former first grade teacher, I often overlook even as a kindergarten teacher and understanding their importance um, as I needed, as I felt like I needed to jump into this letter of the day instruction, but we have to make sure these are solid, no gaps or no holes in that foundation before really introducing those most simple sound spellings. Uh, when we call the basic code, um, but making sure too that we're building on that code knowledge across in, or over into second grade. And what that means is, hey, like we know there are 44 sounds in the English language. Are we systematically teaching all of those 150 different ways to represent those 44 sounds across K to two? That way I'm not left wondering, what is this kindergarten student versus this kindergarten student who's now in my first grade classroom? What have they been taught? Or maybe you're a third grade teacher wondering, where are these gaps? What, where's the misinstruction? We want to make sure that's solid. So that way, third, fourth, and fifth grade teachers, you guys aren't just disregarding those, those uh, word recognition skills, but actually you're able to focus on those smaller meaning of word parts with morphology. So we see this across that systematic approach across those grade levels. But when it comes to where do we begin? What's the most simple thing? It's going to be phonological awareness. Are we giving students an opportunity to engage in that wordplay? Is that instruction really beginning with that sound first approach? We're giving students that oral practice, but it looks like this, right? We're taking away that print. We're using kinesthetic motions to teach those strategies that are gonna be used for blending and segmenting uh, when connecting that to, uh, sound to print down the road. But in order to do that, um, it, or where do we begin? We, we're really starting with what's natural. I always go back to babies using, you know, variegated babbling, right? That's so natural for them. A kid coming in can orally produce those sounds, but really we want to make sure that they're understanding that they're really so important with the words they're going to be reading down the road and how we're actually spelling words. But I will say, and Karen, you know this, this is a shift. This is a shift that, you know, if we don't start that de-implementing, we're thinking, oh my goodness, I should be doing letters of the day. I should be doing letter of the week instruction starting on that second week of school and kindergarten. And that's simply not the case, right? We have to take away some of those practices 
uh, and really say we're starting at the most foundational level. We need to go flat, a slow to, to really explicitly teach these things and make sure there are no gaps there. And when it comes to t introducing those sounds, right, we have to make sure that kids are also um, receiving that in that natural way, receiving that sound first instruction, that explicit instruction. This is the sound we're learning. Um, you know, repeat it after me. Here's this artic articulation guidance, but also that they're able to apply it in fun ways. Sound riddles. Can they actually um, hear the sound in words? And how do I know? Am I checking? You know, Doug Reeves talked about are we using those checks for understanding to determine if students are able to apply uh, what we're teaching? And this is just a quick embedded way in, in CKLA's instruction that we might do this. Can the child actually solve the riddle, hear the er sound that we're learning uh, by giving me a word containing the er sound, right? Um, so do they have the prerequisite skill before connecting anything to print here? Can they hear it? And then as we look at what that, what that means moving forward in complexity or adding on that extra layer of complexity, now we can really look at what decoding looks like because I've introduced that sound first. We've been working with orally manipulating that sound, but now I'm gonna connect it to print. And so as we look at even that scope and sequence, we have to make sure that those pieces of code are explicitly taught in a sequential order, that we are building on the sound spellings we've previously taught the more simple ones um, but, and, and building on those to teach the more complex, but the bottom line is this, prevention. We don't want any gaps. We as educators, classroom to classroom, grade level across grade level within our district, we have to be on the same page here. And a core curriculum, a high quality core curriculum should give you that when it comes to the way that we're systematically introducing all of those sound spellings. You know, we want to eliminate that well, what happens if my kids haven't had this instruction, right? Um, should, I, should I actually go back and teach kindergarten because that's the sound spell they haven't missed, but it goes back to that tier one, the importance of prevention, making sure we're making those informed decisions. Um, but once I've actually connected that new sound to print, I've taught the spelling, when it comes to decoding practice, I have to get, like we have to give our students opportunities to really decode and encode those words in tandem, right? So at the word level, they have to have word awareness. This is a true like uh, deliberate practice opportunity to make sure that they can add, subtract, delete phonemes um, and that they're not just memorizing those words. And I don't know, my video is probably um, not playing at this point because my internet appears to be unstable, um, but we see kids adding, subtracting and deleting phonemes um, by really, uh, you know, changing things like the word um, uh, mat to mate, or here we have at being changed to that. This is a, a really a key c component of, of that deliberate practice that we want to make sure kids can do. The other thing is, is dictation, right? So um, as we look at uh, this dictation activity here on the right, our students, not only able to build and, and build those words and read those words, but can they actually produce those sound spellings and words, right? So can they actually take that new knowledge of this new sound, connect it to its sound spelling, and can they apply it? Can they build on what they know here? So these are really some key characteristics of, of what we should see during instruction. Um, if a child is stuck on CVC words during tier one um, and we're making that conceptual leap, do they still need that? Yes. The role of the teacher in the classroom is really to make sure that we're uh, scaffolding or differentiating our levels of support to help them get there during that tier one block um, in, those, in those years where we're stepping into this implementation and really giving them opportunities to provide targeted tier two instruction outside of the core. But as we move along this reading rope, um, you know, we've looked at this sequential order of skills. And, and word recognition just makes this really easy to lay out, but it comes down to that last strand of the, the rope being sight recognition. You know, good readers are automatically going to connect the sounds of language to print. Um, we don't want that sound by sound decoding as the end goal, right? We want that effortless uh, lifting of the word off the page almost where you can't avoid it. Um, and that is the goal of sight recognition. And so, when it comes to site recognition, what are the tools within a, in a curriculum or during daily instruction that we should see being used? And also, um, are students going to be taught to attend to all the sounds in the words uh, that we've, or all the sounds that we've 
previously taught in those words. So this is where kind of use of level text go out the window. We're not just memorizing words anymore. It really is about giving them that opportunity to apply everything you've explicitly taught uh, when it comes to foundational skills in a connected on level text. Um, and that's exactly what CKLA does. Uh, these are not only beautifully illustrated texts, they're chapter books, but most importantly, they are the tool that not only builds fluency, but they actually build efficacy as students really get to take that, that phenomenal um, systematic instruction that you've provided up until that point and apply it in that connected text that's 100% decodable. And you know, I, I will say this, this is another shift that we might see uh, teachers kind of struggling with that from, from moments during tier one is, is, hey, like my kids haven't had CKLA before. My kids were just making the shift here. Does that mean that, um, you know, as we, uh, as, should they be reading in these texts? Where's the texts that are like, that they can read? Um, that's what I need to be doing during tier one. And that is a shift that is something we have to give teachers time to overcome and really just reinforce the importance of this connected text. This is helping uh, reinforce the skills you've taught that mapping um, when they don't get, when they get to a word they don't know, or maybe you're working with them in a small group setting to intensify those levels of support. I'm reminding them, I'm scaffolding my support uh, or scaffolding um, and, and reminding them to go back to using blending as that primary strategy, reminding them that they can do this. They can orally blend these sounds. And now let's actually apply it in this word for those, for maybe those words that aren't yet decodable, that we're working on uh, um, making sure that they are decodable. And so this is what every kid deserves, that fluency tool, also that opportunity to apply those skills. But most importantly, we know that, um, you know, when it comes to word recognition, the, the ultimate goal of, of reading is comprehending. And we want to make sure that kids have the opportunity to not just read those texts, those engaging on-level texts where they actually get to apply everything we just, they just learned, but also that they have the opportunity to uh, express their comprehension verbally first and then connect it to writing. And so that's exactly what happens in CKLA skill strand is we just read this 100% decodable text. We're actually going to respond to these comprehension questions, providing text-based evidence as we really learn how to develop a sentence at the foundational level, right? And so here we are, we just decoded these words, and now we're encoding them. And it's so great that it works in, in uh, tandem like that because kids are, are reinforcing those sound spellings and those skills that they learned up until that point, but they're also getting to um, demonstrate their comprehension of this text in written form. And so as we look, what moved through that word recognition side of, of CKLA's comprehensive tier one um, literacy program, we really, you know, obviously we've highlighted all of these kind of key instructional practices that, that align with the research, right? This is, um, this is what we know we need to look for. And so maybe there were some things that stood out that you are doing that you're like, oh yeah, we are doing that. We're on the right, uh, you know, we've, we've made that step forward. And maybe there are some practices that you're like, you know, we do need to work on tweaking that. Or maybe we do need to help remind teachers that tier one is about that um, on level uh, instruction and that whenever they're taking, you know, they actually should be targeting those other skills outside of the four, because this is actually what's going to prevent that from happening. And so as we look at um, you know, really where you can go to learn more about CKLA, uh, you can actually request a virtual sample. Um, and so uh, I know that um, our team has been putting so many phenomenal links in the chat and we hope that you can access those. But we also hope that you are able to join us on our upcoming webinars. So Karen, I'll let you uh, make sure we invite everyone to these. All right, well, you can see we've got three upcoming webinars that build in various ways. Uh, we're definitely, as, as I shared earlier with our ecosystem, want to look at personalized learning and also intervention, you know, getting kids back on track using the um, M-Class tools that you may or may not be familiar with, but we'd love to familiarize you with them. Um, and then, you know, we are really emphasizing biliteracy right now. We've got a, a lot of resources to support people. I answered a question in the in the Q&A related to our caminos and lecto escritura. Uh, 
I didn't even talk about lectura, which is our, um, our Spanish language assessment that is on par with our English language assessment in M class. So that um, I'm sure those, those ideas will all be presented on Monday, November 14th. We'd love for you to join any and all of those. And if you can't join them, just sign up. You'll get the recording. And I know folks were asking about that in the chat. You'll get the recording of this today. You'll get the um, slides and we are so happy. I also want to say, Megan, you know, we did, we took a little bit of a different approach today with our introduction uh, before we got into CKLA. We'd love to talk to you more about CKLA. You all have someone in your region where th that you can talk to in terms of a, um, account executive that will definitely explore resources with you further. And we'd love to be there to share the resources with you in a much deeper way than what we really hit upon today. So we are grateful that you're here. I'm grateful it's it's almost the end of Wednesday today. And I'm grateful that Megan got on the mic. You don't know how grateful I am <laughs> that happened. Well, thank you, Karen. And, and as you mentioned, thank you everyone who uh, joined today. Um, we hope to see you at our upcoming webinars. I love the biliteracy questions that we get because it is just so amazing to see uh, how our biliteracy uh, curriculum is working with our English curriculum in areas that really have, uh, you know, dual language um, immersion classrooms. That is just phenomenal, the things we're seeing. So make sure you join that. Um, as you know, uh, there you will be receiving um, your certificate within the next few days. So thank you so much for, for making sure that we have that. But thank you to those of you who asked questions. Uh, hopefully you got your questions answered. If you do have more questions, we'll hang out for a few more minutes and make sure we get your questions answered. But as Karen mentioned, we'd love to talk more with you. Uh, and thank you for your patience. Happy yep. Wednesday, soon Happy to be Wednesday. Thursday. And Megan, I just wanna say you and I get into so many schools. Thank you for all you do for kids. You know, you are out yeah. there doing it every day. And there are a lot of people that are not doing that anymore. And so we are so grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you. You can't imagine how, how appreciative people are. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Karen, I have to say, I love seeing our partners on these calls already. Yes. The partners we get pictures from. Of, of how they really have done a great job with the de-implementation process. And they're already seeing strong CKLA implementations um, during, at this back to school point in, in October. And, and it just speaks volumes to the work that that process takes. And so just, we have so many great partners that we can put you in touch with too. Yeah. Um, if you're feeling overwhelmed or, um, or just kind of want to know more about that process as a whole. And Megan, I Thank will you. admit, I was thrown a little bit today by the tech issues because I wanted to mention one of those partners when we were talking about the focus and the um, efforts and the initiatives. And yeah, we've got a great partner, a, a new partner in Wisconsin that is, that is just knocking it out of the park. And so, um, so yeah, definitely. Want, I'm glad you- Well, I'm and you know, Karen, like- like forward thinking, like we have some customer panels, like some CKLA panels, some M class panels and Amplify reading panels that, I mean, who better to learn from a program than the actual users themselves. Exactly. And so well, um, we'll be- Some of those coming up too. I, I, we should have put a slide in there on the upcoming CKLA panels. I don't think the dates have been set, but we definitely would love for you to come and hear from educators. That's the best thing to do. You wanna learn about CKLA? get into those classrooms, see kiddos, see the kiddos. That's the best thing. And then uh, talk to yeah. folks on the panels. Yeah. Yeah. And just hearing about just this instructional shift themselves, what to anticipate, how can we anticipate the, the kind of the, the growing pains of these instructional shifts as we, we actually begin to implement high quality tier one science-based literacy instruction, but but how we overcome those. And there is a light at the end of the tunnel, obviously, uh, especially when you get to that student achievement place. So thank you again. Um, oh, I love that people have given such positive feedback in the chat. We absolutely love you joining us. So have a good one, everyone. And if you don't have any more questions, we'll call it a day. And thanks, Jaylene, for that customer panel shout out. I'm glad, I'm glad you've attended. Yeah. Wonderful. We have some great, we have some great people 
on our webinars and just this whole new cohort of district administrators who have just grabbed the bull by the horns and have gone dis in large districts, just and I think these are, initiatives, small districts. Megan, I think people are just going to hang out. So we need to thank you so much. <laughs> 